الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعن الله ولعن الله الدائم على عدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Respected Elders and sisters and brothers in Islam and Iman. Tonight is not an ordinary night. It is the night of Ashura. This is the night where the Ahlul Bayt are definitely grieving. And we send our special condolences to Imam Sahib al Zaman, Waliul Asr. In tradition, we're told that. When Imam Sadiq remembered the day of Tasu'a, which just ended, he was very saddened. And he said that may I be sacrificed for my grandfather who was a gharib, who was a stranger away from his homeland. The day of Tasu'a was the day in which it became clear that the Ahlul Bayt and the small number of companions that had joined them would not be joined by anyone else. And they say that the army from Sham reached Karbala and they were able to surround the camp. And the likes of Ubaidullah and Shimr la'anatullahi alayhima were very happy because they knew that this was going to be, in their eyes, a clear victory. It's a night where we can imagine the likes of the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, what they were doing, worshipping Allah on this night. And tomorrow is the day of Ashura, where for the lovers of Imam Hussein والسلام, we are told that this entire day should be spent different than other days. This dunya is here for a purpose and there's nothing wrong in Islam with engaging in the dunya for the sake of the akhirah. But there's a day which is an exception, which is the day of Ashura, where to the extent possible, we're asked to stay away from making acquisitions in the dunya and gathering goods for ourselves and working towards the dunya. But rather we should spend the day remembering the tragedy of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and crying for it and causing others to cry for it and mourning for it and being with the mu'mineen and praying for them and praying that Allah rewards them for their grief. And this coming together of the mu'mineen around the world on the day of Ashura is one of the least duties that we can perform to the imam of our time to show that we care and that we do commemorate and mourn with him. Yesterday night after the program here dispersed, as you're all aware, in one of the centers which is very nearby, 
there was <clears throat> an incident that took place, an Islamophobic incident, a terrorist incident, where the car that was aiming to run over the worshiper, the, 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 the servants of Allah and those, those who were commemorating the martyrdom of Imam Hussein it was, it was filled with people who were shouting racial slurs and Islamophobic comments. And in this climate of the current era that we're in of hate, it seems that definitely this was an act of terror, something that probably was premeditated. Alhamdulillah, it didn't lead to any but he being killed, but there were some severe injuries. And it's definitely an act of concern for us, and we hope that the system of justice will take it seriously the, the way they ought to. And we definitely express our condolences and sympathy to the families who um, had some of their family members injured, and we pray for the swift recovery of all those who were injured. Sometimes when these events take place locally, they fill our attention because it's local and we have a special care and concern for them. But we should never let them be a source of being blinded to the type of suffering and injustice that's taking place around the world. Every day we have young men in Israel, in occupied Palestine, being killed by the security forces. Every day we have children in Yemen dying out of starvation, not having access to proper medicine and supplies. Everywhere in this world we have so many situations of people struggling against injustice and so many casualties. So as a way of, inshallah, uh, praying for the swift shifa and the healing of those who are injured, and as a way of expressing our solidarity and support to all those who are struggling against injustice, whether it be here or around the world, I would invite you to all recite a united, beautiful salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, the topic that we've been discussing has to do with family in Islam and what are some of the main reasons why we have a serious problem when it comes to our families. When we look at the incidents of Karbala, we see many examples filled with the beauty of what a family ought to be like. Yesterday I quoted to you one of them. One of them I want to quote tonight, it takes place on the way to Karbala where Imam Hussein alayhi salam at one point he's riding and it's as if his head falls for a moment and as if he nods off for a bit. And when he opens his eyes he cries out, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. His son Ali al-Akbar is there, he's Worried, why is his father saying this? He goes to him and he says that, what happened, my father? Imam Hussein Hussain says that in my dream, I saw some a cry, I heard a cry being called that you are speeding ahead while towards Jannah while death is speeding towards you from behind. And this was something that I realized that we are going towards death. And so Ali Akbar salam asks his father a question. He says that afalasna al haq is it not the case that we're on the path of truth and righteousness? And uh, his father says that indeed we are. Then Ali Akbar salam says, Idan la nubali bil maut. If that's the case, then we don't have any concern with the death part of it. Imam Hussein salam is so happy by the response of his son. It's something that pleases him to such an extent that right there on the spot, and this is the Imam who is ma'asum, whose dua is mustajab, his, his, his supplication is answered, is always answered. He says that, may you receive the best reward that a son can receive on account of his duty and service and his relationship with his father. We see this type of relationship, we see these type of children, we see these types of statements of purity and taqwa, how does this come about? It comes about because these individuals from the families of the Ahlul Bayt they were the ones who were the best examples in all ways, including how they would live their families. 
one of the main problems that prevents us from having these type of families that are modeled after those families is what we've been talking about throughout the nights, which is the presence of this idol of self. We are in a culture where it's all about me, all about what I want, all about my lower desires. Throughout the nights, you know, I, as I've been preparing for the lectures, there's this one line that's been going through my mind. It's from one of the munajat of Imam Sajjad, one of the whispered conversations. And I f felt that need to be able to quote this line. I feel that it's very informative, very good, useful for us to see this. And tonight I felt that it would be very appropriate. He says in this munajat, it's a very beautiful munajat, um, Ilahi ilayka ashku nafsan bisu'i ammara. Oh my God, I complain to you about my soul. What's wrong with my soul? It commands me to evil. And it makes me go towards committing mistakes. And it makes me go towards committing sins. And it puts me in a situation where um, I'm acquiring your rage, meaning that I'm attracting your rage as opposed to your mercy. It it takes me on the path of those who will be destroyed, and it makes me uh, one who is very weak um, in front of you. Now, what are the qualities of this self? It, I complain a lot. I have all these far-fetched hopes and dreams that don't, are not anchored in reality. In Whenever anything evil happens to me, I don't have any capacity for it. I get really stressed out. And when good things happen to me, I become miserly, I become selfish, I don't share with others. I am inclined towards play and sport and divergence. I'm filled with um, distractions and forgetfulness. Brothers and sisters, this is a, a very apt description of what's happening in the modern times. And we have to be aware of this, that this is where our soul is tending towards. Somebody who is attracted to lahu and la'ib, to play and sport and diversion, they can't have any tolerance for any type of difficulty. These are the people who, for whom marriage and family life is going to be a big deal, at least the way that Islam envisioned it. And so the first thing I want to mention tonight is that as we're, yesterday I mentioned a number of um, points that I feel are very fundamental and important for us to be able to improve our families. Tonight I want to mention two things, two major points. The first one is this, is that if we want to be able to um, start fixing our family lives, then we need to remind ourselves what marriage is all about. You see, marriage is not just um, a type of friendship that we now take um, into a situation where we're living together. Like, let's say, for example, there's a guy and a girl, and they have a friendship. Okay, and let's say that they're not observing the Islamic guidelines regarding friendship. And Islam says that we're not supposed to be friends with um, non-Mahrams. We can be having cordial relationships. We can be um, uh, having uh, good professional working relationships. We can be cordial. We can be friendly. But we're not supposed to be friends in, the, in terms of being close and sharing personal sort of things. That's not um, what Islam envisions. Let's say somebody doesn't observe that. They have a relationship. They have two friends. Okay, and then they get close, right? They start chatting. They get to know each other. They're like, okay, let's get married. And so they go into marriage and they think that, okay, now it's the same thing, but now we're going to be together. Now that type of relationship is not what marriage is about. Because what happens in that relationship, in a marriage, I mean, sorry, in friendship, um, you can be there for the person when it's good for you, but when times get a little bit tougher, you can kind of, um, you know, you can log out. You can go offline. And then a few days later, you go back, you're like, oh, where were you? Oh, you know, I, I just needed to like, kind of detox from social media for some time and I'm back now. Right? You can be there for them during certain hours, but you can be for yourself in the other hours. You can, when, when it's something, so what are you doing tonight? Oh, yeah, that's something that sounds good to me. Okay, I'll join you. But if it's something that's not good to me, I won't join you. See, friendship is a lot of times it's about me, especially the way that they're formed according to um, the secular standards. But marriage is much more than that. Marriage, of course, involves building a true friendship between two individuals. But it involves incredible sacrifice along the way. It is not about me, it's about the other person. And it's about how I can grow closer to Allah by means of 
being a conduit for this person to grow closer to Allah. Ayatollah Khamenei, in one of his advices regarding marriage, he says that marriage is about you two, like he's talking to a couple, he's saying you two go and get each other into heaven. Make each other people of heaven. That's what the philosophy behind marriage is supposed to be about. And marriage is not a fashion statement either. You know, sometimes people, they treat family life and marriage kind of like this, that, okay, I live my whole life where everything, what I derive pleasure from is how people perceive me. And how do I know that? Because I always am posting pictures and getting feedback from people. Now, when I see that my friends are getting married, it's that time, okay, I'll get married as well too, and I'll make it a big photo thing. We're always be photo, posting photos of you know us and you know, being here and being there and then wedding photos and this thing and then we go on this honeymoon and it's all a big show, right? It's all a big thing because everyone else is doing. Now I want to have that be part of my image that I'm forming as well. But sometimes you go and you go beyond the facade of all these pictures of you know them laughing and everything. You realize that there's serious problems, right? That's not a real marriage either. A marriage isn't about doing something to make other people impressed with you. A marriage is about trying to serve God by entering this relationship. So that's point number one. Now point number two, brothers and sisters, is what I want to focus the bulk of my comments on, is that one of the major problems that we have when it comes to marriage is the lack of understanding the different roles that Islam envisions for the male and the female genders. This is extremely important that we understand that in Islam, Islam is a system which is based on justice and equity, but there are times when equity and justice calls for lack of equality. The Islamic marriage model is not a mo model where both the husband and wife play equal roles and have equal responsibilities. But rather, it's kind of like an ecosystem where you have you know, different organisms and they're interacting with each other and they play different roles. So... In order for a marriage to be successful, they have to understand that there's complementary roles that are envisioned, but they're not the same roles. Because this is such a difficult issue for many people to accept, I thought I would first lay the grounds for this by mentioning what is the Islamic perspective on genders. Because immediately when we usually talk about these issues, the reaction is that, well, you're being sexist. Islam, na'udhu billah, is being unfair. It's favoring, let's say, males over females. So I want to just set the ground straight and, you know, as, as, the fundum, as, the, as the foundation for this by going to the Qur'an. Okay, what does the Qur'an say? In Surah An-Nisa, Surah 4, 124, Allah says, A'udhu billahi Wa man ya'amal min as-salihati min dhakarin aw untha wa huwa mu'minun Whoever does good, okay, continuous, um, excessive good, meaning that they're staying away from evil as well, whether they be male or female, and they have iman, then they are the ones who will enter paradise, and they will not um, be treated unjustly even a bit. Allah clearly states that from the Quranic worldview, there is no difference, gender doesn't count in terms of being able to soar towards perfection and be able to achieve the purpose which we've been created for, which is not this world, but it's the hereafter. That's verse number one. Verse number two is from Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 35. You've heard of this verse before. Um, what we're told that one of the potential occasions for revelation of this verse is that there was one of the um, lady of ladies of the from the family of the prophet, um, one of the wives of the prophet, who who was asking the prophet and saying that do we have any verses in the Quran which speak about the merits and excellences of women? You see, in the Arabic language, um, when you use the plural form in the masculine, it means both men and women. It doesn't just mean like just men. Um, this is something that's well known to anybody who knows it, who studies Arabic. Um, and based on this rule of that. Excellence is not limited to gender. Um, all the verses that talk about people who are, for example, uh, al-mu'minun, al-muslimun, and uh, al-muttaqun, um, the Muslims and the people of faith and the people of taqwa, all of them apply to both males and females. But this lady was confused. She says that, oh, Rasulullah, is there any verse which mentions uh, females specifically? Allah, in order to clarify any misconceptions regarding this, He reveals this verse, which is the following. 
إن المسلمين والمسلمات والقانتين والقانتات والصادقين والصادقين والصادقات والصابرين والصابرات والخاشعين والخاشعات والمتصدقين والمتصدقات and so on and so forth where um, there's all these descriptions the Muslims whether they be male or female the truthful ones whether they be male or female the um, the people who give charity, whether they be male or female, the people who have self-restraint, whether they be male or female, and so on and so forth. Those who protect themselves and guard their, um, you know, their chastity, whether they be male or female. Those who remember Allah frequently, whether they be male or female. Um, all of them, karima. All of them, Allah has preferred for them um, a great reward, and this heavenly blessing called maghfirah, which we normally translate as forgiveness, but it's something which um, perhaps is much deeper and much more profound than just um, forgiveness from sins. Now, what's clear from that verse is that what counts in the eyes of Allah um, is these type of traits, not the gender. Things like truthfulness and honesty and, and persistence and patience in the times of distress and um, being one who remembers Allah frequently, etc. These are the things which matter for the sake of Allah. Now, having said that, we do have verses which mention that there are differences between males and females. Okay, and in today's world, with all the different discussions regarding gender identity and fluidity and whatnot, sometimes we have to remind ourselves of things which are obvious and, you know, it's just like it doesn't require a thought regarding. Now, it's as if that Allah knew that there would come a time when people would be confused about this. Um, in Surah um, Ali Imran, verse number 36, uh, Allah is describing um, the story of the birth of Maryam alayhi salam. You know the story that her mother um, had didn't have ch children for a long time, and um, the father and mother made a du'a, um, which was that if you give us a child, then we will dedicate the child towards the service of the house of God. Now at that time, um, all the people who served the house of God were males, so. She was given a child. And when she delivers the child, she notices that, okay, the child is a female. So what does she say? When she delivered the baby, she says that, oh my Lord, um, I, have delivered a, I have delivered a female. And then Allah makes a comment there for us. He says, Allah knows better what she delivered. The male is not like a female. There are fundamental differences, brothers and sisters. Today, if you go to um, what you know, people who study human biology say, scientists, they say that males and females are so different that it doesn't have to just do with differences in certain parts of the body, but rather the differences run so deeply that even down to the basic building block of the body, the cell, there are differences as to whether it's a cell which comes from the body of a male versus the body of a female. And these days they're talking about this idea of having gender equity when it comes to medicine. They say that most medicines have been formulated and the prescriptions have been formulated on the basis of testing on male subjects. But in order to really do justice to medicine, we need to actually take into account that the body of a male and the body of a female are so different that it makes a difference when it comes to the tests and the trials and the statistics that we get as a result. So this is something which is widely accepted, that there's differences between males and females. We shouldn't you know, think that with some of the propaganda regarding gender identity that there's no difference when it comes to this biological sex. There is a very fundamental difference. Now, yes, it can be the case that um, due to various factors that somebody might feel like identifying with um, a different sex than their biological sex. Okay, but that's not something which said, means that they're, they're the same. No, there is fundamental um, differences between a male and a female. So now, having said that, um, I want to now go to um, what is the main thing that Islam is calling us to do when it comes to the differences between males and females in the relationship between the husband and the wife. So if we want to summarize this, um, this is on the basis of the teachings of some of the experts in um, tarbiyah and family life, um, the leading experts today, um, including especially um, one of the experts, his name is Ustad Abbasi. Um, and um, he's somebody who just is very profound in terms of his outlook and his um, viewpoints. Now, 
If we want to summarize it, what we can say is this, that when it comes to what the missing ingredient that we have today in our families is that when it comes to males, what we tend to be lacking is positive masculinity. And when it comes to females, what we tend to be lacking is positive femininity. What I mean by positive is that both of these terms, masculinity and femininity, um, they have certain negative connotations. And I don't want to involve those in the discussion. But what I'm trying to say is that there is something about being a man or something about being a female which is very special and unique to the identity of a female or a male, of a man or a woman. And that thing needs to be identified, it needs to be cherished, it needs to be treasured, it needs to be used in our relationships, and it needs to be taught to our children as well. But in the society we're in, unfortunately, that thing is going away. What kind of society are we living in right now, brothers and sisters? Well, ask yourself this question. Who is the, what's the target profile of somebody who is successful? Who is it? Who, is the mo who are the most successful people that society considers successful? Is it somebody who is able to do an amazing job at being, the help, being able to help others? No. That can be useful. It can be used as, a, as some mark, but it's not the main thing. Is it somebody who, let's say, um, performs their duties to their Lord in the best way possible? No. So what is it? What we find is the, you know, that mark of what is success. It's kind of like this, you know, successful corporate CEO. You know, somebody who is like, um, they can be the boss of everyone else. They can tell what other, everyone else what to do. They rise up through the corporate ladder. Nobody can tell them what to do. They bark orders, they, and they have their own companies, and basically they live life the way they want to live it. They're very wealthy, and that sort of thing. And that identity is something which is shared whether you're a male or a female. Okay, now you might disagree with me on this, and you might say that, no, you know, people appreciate, for example, let's say somebody who's a family person or what, but I don't think so. I think that that is sort of the thing that we're being pushed towards. So what does that mean? What that means is on a practical level, what's happening in families is that you have two people who are striving to have the same qualities and characteristics. They both want to be a CEO. They both want to be barking orders at each other. They both want to be the ones who nobody can tell what to do. And then what happens is serious conflict. Why is there serious conflict? Well, number one, brothers and sisters, um, when it comes to families, families are supposed to be based on love. And love is something that comes about through attraction. And the, what we're attracted to is something that Allah has wired with us with. We, we've been created, at least in, unless there's been some you know, thing that has happened which has um, taken us off the normal course of development, there's certain things that males are attracted to and there's certain things that females are attracted to. Brothers and sisters, males are attracted to females, typically. Males are not typically attracted in that way to other males. And females are attracted to males and that positive masculinity side of the males. And they're not attracted to, let's say in that way, the femininity side of a male. And so when you have a, an issue where you have two, one male and one, you know, female who is taking on the characteristics of masculinity, then it tends to reduce the attraction. It makes marriage be something which doesn't have the joy that it ought to have. So that, that's one problem which is a major problem. Problem number two is that when you have families that are like this, where you have, let's say, two masculine-like figures who are living, living, living together, then what happens is that um, it prevents um, the two from being able to achieve the purpose for which they've been created. Because whenever we have certain traits which are told to us that, okay, Islam says that this is the way you should be. If you're a male, you should have positive masculinity. If you're a female, you should have positive femininity. Okay? So let's say I don't want to do that. I want to be, uh, like, I want to have the masculinity. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So then, what do I need to do? Okay, if, if that's the case, that I'm going to ignore that. What I'm preventing myself from doing is achieving that type of spiritual blessings that Allah has um, 
placed for me. This is a path he wants me to take, and I'm ignoring that. Okay. Now, um, the other thing that I'm ignoring is the fact that this is something that inside of myself I actually want to be like. I, a, a male actually does want to be somebody who has the positive masculinity uh, being shown in him. A male does not fitratan, meaning that innately he doesn't like to be somebody who has to suppress his positive masculinity. The same way a female would like to be like that. But when the circumstances are such that she's suppressing, she's actually denying herself of that thing which she actually wants to be like. So what do I mean by this? Positive masculinity, positive femininity. Let's go to the masculinity part first. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, um, in Surah An-Nisa, الرجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض. Allah Taala says that the males are the managers of women on account of what Allah has made, given them over the women, and on account of them providing for them financially. That's like an interpretation of the verse. Allah clearly states that in that relationship, it's not the case where both there's two. CEOs, there's two managers. No, there is a manager, and there are those who are being managed. And the managerial role is given to the male. Now, where do we get this idea of um, positive femininity? Um, we get it from uh, many traditions and you know, different understandings of verses of the Quran. But one of them is a famous one, which is from Amir al Mu'minin. In Nahl Jabalagha, he is um, writing a letter to his son, and he says that, فَإِنَّ الْمَرْأَةَ Rehanatun walaysat biqahramana. Indeed, a woman is like a sweet smelling flower, and she is not one who is a qahramana. Qahramana means somebody who is sort of the person on the ground who's in charge of everything. They're the ones who are sort of running around, manage everything. She's not given that role of being the manager. Now, brothers and sisters, when you talk about these gender roles, and I'm sure you've heard this before, um, Sometimes we have a resistance to that. Okay, we don't like to hear that. We don't like to hear this idea that somehow um, I need to hold myself in a certain way that may be um, different than the way I want to. It goes against the idol of the self, which says that I always want to be the one who is in charge. Now, there's a problem that we have here on both sides. From the male side, we have this problem that males are not asserting, asserting the authority that they should be asserting. When we're talking about positive masculinity, we're not talking about being a dictator, we're not talking about um, being somebody who forces his family to do things. Um, if you look at dictators, right, they're never successful. Dictators who try to rule by fear are those who eventually fall. What we're talking about here is successful managers successful leaders, those who are able to create real connections with the people that they're leading, and because of the respect they have towards them, they accept them and they follow them. That's what we mean by positive masculinity, being a man in the positive sense. When we're talking about being a, a female, and we use the example of a flower, we don't, we're not saying here that um, a female should be, uh, from the Islamic perspective, that a female is, ideal female is one who is weak, and who you know, doesn't know how to take a stand on anything is, let's say, um, just like a wallflower. No. What we're talking about here is that positive, delicate aspect of what it means to be a female that no male can have that even if he tries hard enough himself. He won't be able to do it. It's what it means to be a female. Those feminine things that are part of being a female. Now, one of the main problems that we have in accepting these is that we tend to think of them as being limitations. We think, to, we think that, okay, if it's going to be the case that I need to be a, playing a supportive role, I need to be somebody who, for example, um, listens to, and, t listens to the, and, and accepts the leadership of my husband, if I'm the wife, um, then what that means is that I am not going to be somebody who can ever be a leader. I'm never going to be somebody who can be, let's say, uh, expressing her opinion or somebody who is going to be able to be successful. Okay? Now, these type of understandings um, are not a correct understanding of these traditions. 
You see, in Islam, we have this idea of an insan who is kamil, a perfect human being. What is a perfect human being? A perfect human being is a being that encapsulates all the attributes of perfection and mirrors the perfection of Allah. Allah in the Quran tells us about his names and his attributes. For example, in Surah Al-Hadid, verse number three, he says, huwa al-awwalu wal akhiru wal zahiru wal batin. He is the first and he is the last. He is the apparent and he is the hidden. Now, have you ever thought about this verse right here? It's saying things which apparently are contradictory, right? That he is the one who is the first and he's the one who's last. He's the one who is apparent and he's hidden. For any one of us, if we were to say that we're first and we're last, it wouldn't really make sense. Like, let's say you're in a line of people and then you say that, okay, I'm first and I'm last as well too. You can't be, right? Or let's say that, okay, you're the one who's um, in the forefront or the one, you're the one who's hidden. You can't say that you're both in the forefront and you're hidden at the same time. But when it comes to Allah Ta'ala, because of His freedom from the material realm, the rules change for Him. Where He's able to take on these characteristics which for us would apparently be conflicting with each other. Okay, it's an important point I'm trying to lead up to. I hope that you got that. When it comes to Allah, it's something that we accept. Now let's go to the human being. Can it be the case that a human being can take on different characteristics that are apparently opposite to each other. Allah Ta'ala can be the first, He can be the last. He can be the one who is the most merciful and the one who is the most severe in taking revenge as well. Right? In dua, for example, we say that He is Arhum al Rahimin fi mawdi al Afi wa Rahma. He's the most merciful of the mercifuls when it comes to um, places where He's going to forgive people. But He's also Ashaddu al Ma'aqibin. He's the one who is the most severe in punishment when it's called for that. Can a human being take on that type of role as well? The answer is yes. A human being has the capacity to take on different characteristics in different situations. One of the best examples we have of that is Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Imam Ali alayhi salam is somebody who is renowned in history for being able to display characteristics which apparently are impossible for most people to have at the same time. It's hard to find anybody in history who is so fearsome in battle that they could make a claim that if you bring all of the Arabs and you line them up on the opposite side, I won't turn my back even an instant if I have to fight them. But the same Imam, the same Amir, the same leader is the one who is so compassionate that when he hears that the army of Muawiyah had trespassed and violated the rights of a lady from the Ahlul Kitab, he says that, I feel so, I'm paraphrasing, I feel so bad about this that she didn't have any way to defend herself except for her crying. And that man was taking away her jewelry and her possessions and there was no one there to help her. That if somebody were to die out of grief over what has happened and over the injustice that took place to her, then I would not blame him in any way. That's a type of compassion that he had at the same time. So you see, brothers and sisters, the role models that we have are individuals who are able to take on multiple roles and show different characteristics in different situations. Now if you take this to family life, it's a huge lesson for us that there are times when we are asked to take on a certain role, but that doesn't mean that Allah wants us to be limited to that and somehow it's demeaning us and saying that, you know what, you're not capable of doing anything else. But rather it's saying that for the sake of Allah, in order to achieve the desired objective, this is the way that you have to be. Now, see if you can train yourself that in this situation to be like that. I'll give you an example that we have. There's a well-known tradition that we have uh, reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says that indeed, and this is reported in multiple books um, through various chains of transmission. Some of them are considered to be um, authentic and it's a well-accepted tradition. 
He's sitting with his companions. He says that, let me tell you about the best of women. And then he goes on to talk about the best of men, and he talks about the, best of, the worst of women and the worst of men. Okay? So he says that, indeed, the best of your women is the one who is Aziza, um, the one who is Aziza tun fi ahliha wa dhalila tu ma'a ba'aliha. Okay? Now, before I go on, I just want to explain the meaning of Aziza. Sometimes in Aziz, Aziz and Izza takes on different meanings. In this tradition, Izza doesn't mean somebody who is dear and loved. What it means is somebody who doesn't um, accept the outside influence and authority. So what is it saying? It's saying that the best of women is one who, when she gets married, she does not accept the outside influence of her family, but she does accept the authority and the influence of her husband. So what is the Prophet calling the woman to do? To say that, look, you have to, now that you're gone to this household, before you were under the control and you were being influenced and you were part of that household, you still maintain your ties, you still show your respect, you still do Salat al-Rahim as need be, you still have the connection and the family ties as need be, but you have a different role that you're taking on now. And now your home and your relationship with your husband and future children, it's a different household. And your responsibility is not to accept influence from others, even if it's your own family that you were born into, but rather you do have to accept the authority and influence of your husband. Okay, and then he goes on to describe some of the traits um, the one who listens to the command of her husband and accepts it. Now, that's what, and then on the other hand, he says that the worst of women are those who are the opposite, that they still are under the influence and they accept the command from their home that they were born into, and they are aziz with their husband, meaning that they refuse to accept the authority of their husband. Now, we also have those traditions when talking about the, the husband as well. Um, the, the, worst, the best of husbands, for example, is the one who... Um, is very generous, the one who um, comes from a good lineage, the one who is good to his parents, the one who doesn't cause his dependents to have to depend on somebody else to support them. Now, when we come to this tradition, brothers and sisters, this is a key point from the lecture. Do we say that it means that um, Islam wants a, husband, a man to be generous, but a woman to be miserly? Islam wants um, uh, a man to be uh, good to his parents, but a woman to be mean to his parents, because that's what it mentions as the quality of the best of men. Or it wants um, the uh, wife to be somebody who is obedient and accepts the authority of her husband, um, and in every other circumstance, it wants her to be the same way and be somebody who's a, a yes woman. She doesn't have any say of her own. She doesn't have any opinion or anything like that. Not at all. Not at all. Islam calls us towards perfection, to be able to have the right behavior and the right attitude in the circumstance that we're in. And in this relationship, it has to be one where it's complementary. There has to be leadership. And that leadership has been placed with the male. And he needs to show that, he needs to embrace it. He needs to be somebody who thinks about things, who's decisive, who is able to take on responsibility. And the wife is somebody who needs to accept that and show him that type of deference. Show him that type of support that I accept you as the leader in the family. And it's not in any way some type of limitation, rather it's an opportunity for growth. I hope inshallah that that's clear. If I can ask you to recite salawat, please. The problem is, brothers and sisters, is that we live in a society where this is being questioned, it's challenged. If you go to the media, the portrayal of the father and the husband is one which is completely opposite of this. The typical father is one who is weak. He's indecisive. He's unintelligent. He makes a lot of mistakes. He bumbles around. He has to apologize a lot for what he does. There are numerous, just as an example, it's an area of interest to me because I feel like this is one of the ways we can understand what's happening to our children. There are a number of cartoons made by Disney which have the same type of theme, which is what? That there's a girl who gets into her teenage years and she finds the home environment to be something which is restrictive, especially her father. He's telling her to do things in a traditional way, telling her to like, you know, stay home and you know, don't involve yourself with these type of things. And she says that 
I am going to be my own woman. I'm going to decide things on my own. And then she goes away. She leaves. For example, in one of them, you know, she, uh, I don't know, there's a vampire or a Dracula or something, and she wants to go and elope with a human being. So she does it. Now, at the end of it, after the whole plot and everything happens, what ends up happening is that the father inevitably has to go to his daughter and apologize and say that, you know, I was the one who was wrong. You were totally entitled to be able to leave the home, disobey whatever rules that we have, break out of any type of rules and regulations, be your own person, make your own decisions, and I'm the one who has to apologize to you. Time and time again, that's the image that's presented. This is dangerous, brothers and sisters. When we see that as being the model, it becomes very difficult for us to accept these type of ideas of, okay, there's an authority figure. Another problem that we have, brothers and sisters, is that we tend, we unfortunately are moving away from the standards that have been set for us from the Ahlul Bayt You know how I said that we have in tradition that a woman is like a sweet-smelling flower? And I said that it doesn't mean that she's weak or that somehow she's a wallflower, but it means that she has that type of delicate, positive femininity which needs to be appreciated, which needs to be cherished and fostered. Now, sometimes people take exception to that. They say that, okay, well, maybe that was for that time. But in this time, we want to be strong, we want to be independent, we want to voice our own opinion all the time. We don't want to be told what to do. Brothers and sisters, what if the best of people was the one who was a sweet-smelling flower in her family? Would that make it something which is okay? These type of traditions and these type of titles and roles are not just for us. This is what the Ahlul Bayt themselves were like. In one tradition, we're told that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was gifted with Sayyidatu Nisa al Alameen. Right? He was gifted with his daughter. The companions were looking at him when they found out that he had a girl. They were all like upset for him. They were feeling bad for him. They're like, oh, you know, he'd have a son, right? It's too bad. And he looked at him and he says, what's wrong with you? I've been given a rayhana. I've been given a sweet-smelling flower. And her risk is guaranteed from God. Right? From that time, he sees his daughter as being like this. And when Amir al-Mu'minin is talking about his merits and his excellences, you know, there's sometimes, Imam al Islam had enough excellences of his own if he wanted to talk about you know, his merits. But at one point, we see that he talks about his merit in, with relationship to Sayyidah Fatima. He says that, um, if you want to know who I am, he says that, um, I am the husband of Al Batul, Sayyidatu Nisa al Alameen, Fatima to At Taqiya to Naqiya to Zakiya to Al Mubarra to Al Mahdiya to Habiba to Habibillah. And then he goes on to say that she's the best of the children, she is the pure lineage, and Warehana to Rasulullah. She is the sweet smelling flower of the Messenger of Allah. Brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves that the Ahlul Bayt are the standard for what's right and what's wrong. Al Haqqu ma radaytumuhu wal batilu ma sakhatumuhu. In Zarat al Jam al Kabir, we say that truth is what you are pleased with, and that which is false is what you are displeased with. I'm moving towards the end of my speech, but there's just a couple more points that I want to wrap up the discussion with. Brothers and sisters, one of the main problems that we find that prevents us from accepting the teachings of God and Ahlul Bayt when it comes to our families. From, from accepting, for the, from the male to accept that he has to step into that role of positive masculinity. He needs to be somebody who is a, one who is a thinker, he's responsible, he doesn't waste his life playing video games. He plans ahead, he knows that, okay, this is a major responsibility that's waiting for him. One of the major tasks in his life is to get married and to support for his family. He's developing those skills. He's going to be providing for them. He's going to be taking decisions. And for the lady to foster that positive femininity, for her to know that her goal in life is not just to become a masculine female, for her to be somebody who's going to be, play that supportive role, the, the center for emotional support. Um, if we want to do that, one of the things that we need to make sure that we do is realize that 
we don't create false notions of what gives us entitlement. One of the problems that we have in our society right now is that when people start getting degrees and they start getting positions, um, they start to think that, okay, well, yeah, it's true that Islam says this, but you know, um, I'm earning money. I have a job. I can have a life without you. And so, even though I know that these are the things that are there, you know, if it doesn't really, if I don't really want to do it, then I'm not going to do it. But sisters, we have to think about this, that let's say that I have the capability to like be this top earner and I'm a male or I'm a female, whatever it is, right? I have incredible earning potential. Does that give me some type of entitlement to now set my own standards for what's right and wrong? It shouldn't be. But somehow we sometimes feel that yes, it actually does. Now everyone has to respect me. I have to be the one who call, makes the call. I have a PhD. I have a good job. I'm the one who's earning. Therefore, it's all about me. Sometimes we need to think about the examples that we have. I'm going to give you two examples. And we have to ponder on this. Khadija Khadija was somebody who had incredible earning potential. She was the richest lady of her time. But what is the means by which she achieves that high level of spiritual perfection such that Angel Jibreel, when he comes to visit Rasulullah, he makes a special point to say that, oh, Rasulullah, uh, if you can please convey a special message of salam to Khadija. What is it that makes her deserve that? When she goes to marry the Prophet, we're told in history, the Prophet is saying to her that, okay, well, you, know, you have all this wealth, you have all this position, you have this status, I don't have these things. What does she say? She says that, oh, um, I, what, I, I am giving myself to you. Is it, would it be right for somebody who gives themselves to somebody for not to give all their wealth and all their positions and everything that to them as well too? She tells him that everything that I have is now yours. So she becomes somebody who's penniless. But as a result of that sacrifice for the message of truth and for the spread of Islam, she becomes one of the ladies of Jannah. Okay, that's example number one. Example number two is Salman. Salman is somebody who didn't have high earning potential. Maybe today, most ladies who would marry Salman al-Farisi, if they would look at his material possessions, they'd be like, you know what? I'm going to be the one who calls the shots here because he can't make money. Right? He used to have all of his possessions, he used to be able to carry them with him. At one point, he had only one like Abba that he would use as his uh, table caught spread, he would use it as, as, as his blanket. That's all he had. And we're told that in one tradition it says that there was somebody who went to see Rasulullah and he was with Salman at that time. And Rasulullah had so much respect for Salman that he would have private time for him. And that man complains. He says, oh Rasulullah, either he goes or I go. But I can't stand you know, to be with this type of person, you know, this cloth and everything like that. According to the hadith, this is something which is so great in the eyes of Allah that Allah reveals a verse telling us that, look at, get your standards straight here of what's successful and what's not. Don't think that wealth gives you entitlement for somehow now you can start calling the shots. Wasbir. Wasbir nafsaka ma'al ladina yad'una rabbahum bil ghadati wal ashi yuriduna wajha. Wala ta'adu aynaka anhum. Turidu zinat al hayat al dunya. One of my teachers. Um, once said that this verse is so important for us to remember that he said that if we were to write it in gold for ourselves and remind ourselves of it, it wouldn't be um, any type of wastefulness in terms of spending. Do not restrain yourself with those who call upon Allah day and night. They want to, they, they are seeking Him. And do not turn your, away, your eyes away from them seeking the, the zina of the dunya. But then sisters, this thing which is very dangerous. Sometimes, you know, we have this hunger for being successful in the corporate world. But this takes us away from our natural dispositions. For example, the teachers of, uh, of those, those teachers who are, who are experts in ethics and they're aware of family matters, they say that one of the problems, one of the ways that a woman can lose her femininity, the positive version of it, is when she spends a lot of time in an environment, in a work environment, where there's a lot of males present. Because... The same way that we have these innate characteristics, we are influenced by the environment that we're in. The same way that if a, a, a man were to spend a lot of time in a work environment where there's a lot of, let's say, women, it might be a similar sort of thing. 
So we have to be careful about this, that in our hunger for the dunya, what are we sacrificing? What's happening at home then? We go back home and we think that it's the same thing the way it is at work where, you know, I can get coffee when I want and I can do this and I get my paycheck and it's all about me. Right? And when I come home, I expect to be treated, everything's the same because I earn and you earn so we have the same responsibilities at home. That's not the type of balance that Islam envisions. So this is the night, brothers and sisters, for us to ask ourselves then, how much are we taking the Ahlul Bayt as an example for us? How much desire do we have to accept and receive those special blessings that are waiting for those who take the path of the Ahlul Bayt As we shed these tears, let they be tears of repentance, of turning to Allah and saying that this is the haqq that I want to pursue. This is the lifestyle that I want for myself. Tonight is a very difficult night. We remember the musibah of the youngest martyr of Karbala. And as an introduction to the Masab, which inshallah will be recited, I just want to mention a few words. Sallallahu alayka ya Aba Abdullah Sallallahu alayka Ayyuha al-maqtul Bi ardi Karbala Tushana Sallallahu alayka ya safina tan Peace and blessings be upon you, O Chief of Martyrs. O the one who was slain on the banks of the river Euphrates. While his mouth was thirsty, peace be upon you and upon that six month old baby whose only crime was that he was thirsty in the desert. There are so many scenes from Karbala that pain our hearts, brothers and sisters. But perhaps that one scene which has a special pain for us and the Ahlul Bayt is the martyrdom of that pure baby. In one report, we're told that Imam Hussein alayhi salam was complaining to Rasulullah. He was saying, Ya Jadda, qatalu wallahi rijalana. Ya Jadda, dabahu wallahi yatfalana. Oh my grandfather, they are the ones I swear by Allah, they have killed our men folk. Oh my grandfather, I swear by Allah, they have killed our children, they have slaughtered our children. The bah means not just slaughtering, but it means cutting the head off. But we can understand that it wasn't just that six-month-old child whose head was separated from his body, but there were others as well. We're told that when Minhal, the companion of Mukhtar, returns to Medina, he goes to Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. He wants to give him the news that the killers of Karbala, the killers of the family of the Prophet, revenge has been taken on them. He goes to Imam, he starts to give him the news. Imam alayhi salam interrupts him and tells him, but tell me about Harmala. 
tell me about Harmala. We can understand that among all those who are martyred, the one who has a, whose, whose martyrdom caused the most pain and severe pain in the heart of Zainab, in the heart of Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, and the other Ahlul Bayt was the martyrdom of the six-month-old baby.